the regular broadcast of the Minneapolis Committee of the Whole for March 22nd, 2022 will now begin. Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmasano and I'm the chair of the Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, March 22nd. I'd like to note for the record, this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared local state of public health emergency. I will also note that the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channels. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll and clarify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Present. Councilmember Rainville. Present. Councilmember Vita. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Here. Councilmember Osman. Here. Councilmember Goodman. Present. President Jenkins. Present. Councilmember Chugtai. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Vice Chair Chavez. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. 13 members present. Let the record reflect we have a quorum. We have three items on the agenda today in addition to our reports of committees. Um, I'll begin with our discussion agenda, which has one item. It's the 2022 assessment report, and I'll invite our director, Rebecca Malmquist from the city assessor's office to speak on that item. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Palmasano and committee members for providing us this time to share some of the highlights of the 2022 assessment with you. Thank you to our staff for creating and con contributing to the report. I would like to note that we have members of our leadership team with us here today. Nancy Wojcik, the new Director of Assessments, Brian Keyser, Chief Appraiser, and Brian Messer and Tim Oven, our Appraisal Supervisors. Next slide, please. First, a high-level summary and reminders about the assessment. We recently completed the January 2nd, 2022 assessment of estimated market values for approximately 131,000 properties. This is an annual process as dictated in statute. The notices of evaluation and classification, commonly known as the value notices, have been mailed. It is important to remind everyone that the 2022 estimated market values are used to calculate next year's 2023 property taxes. We value properties in one year, then the budget and levy are set, and then taxes are payable the following year. We know that this can be confusing because property tax statements are mailed at approximately the same time as value notices. The payable 2022 property tax statements that property owners are receiving now were calculated using last year's 2021 assessed value. Another important reminder is that the data we use to set the annual assessment is also dictated by the state. For the January 2nd, 2022 assessment, we analyzed sale transactions that occurred between October of 2020 and September of 2021. Next slide, please. In Minnesota, Property taxes provide a significant portion of the funding for local government. Every property share of taxes is based on its market value, property use, and government local government budgets, which become a tax rate. You can see the image at the bottom of the screen for a simplified illustration. Market value is the price a property would sell for on the open market. The assessor's role is to reflect the real estate market and set fair and accurate market values by following market trends. The assessor also classifies a property according to its use. Different uses of property, even if they have the same value, pay different taxes because of the class rates set by the state legislature. We will provide an example in a moment. The tax rate is used to determine the budgets of local governments such as city, county, school district, and watersheds. Next slide, please. The intermediary step in converting value to taxes is called the tax capacity. 
This slide illustrates how this works for some common types of properties in the city. The calculation for tax capacity is the market value in the second column multiplied by the class rate in the third column. For example, as you can see here, a residential property on the first line and a commercial property on the bottom line, both assessed at $300,000 will pay different taxes. And that is because the class rate for a residential property is 1% and the class rate for a commercial property is 2%. As a result, a residential property will pay approximately half the property taxes of a commercial property. I must note that this is a very simplistic model illustrating the tax calculation. There are many more complex factors that affect taxes, such as special programs like a homestead, state general tax, and fiscal disparities. Next slide, please. This slide is a historical view of the city's total estimated market value. The overall estimated market value, as we refer to as EMV, for this city increased by 6.6% to just over $64 billion in 2022. I would note that this does not include utility and railroad values, which are assessed by the state as those values are not yet available. Next slide, please. This slide is a visualization of the breakdown of the three major property type categories by the 2022 total market value on the left and tax capacity on the right. Because of the calculation of value to tax discussed on the previous slide, there is a change in the distribution between the three categories when we move from the market value to tax capacity. You can see here that residential values in green comprise nearly 60% of the city's total market value on the left. However, when class rates are applied, the residential portion of the tax capacity is just over 50%. You can also see that the commercial value in blue comprises about 20% of the city's total market value, however, comprises 30% of the tax capacity. Next slide, please. This chart is a historical view of the tax capacity as a percentage of the total tax capacity by property type. When we compare 2021 to 2022, the two bars to the furthest right, you can see the year to year shift between commercial, apartment and residential properties. There is a shift with commercial properties in blue being a smaller portion of the total compared to last year, meaning the residential property owners will bear more of the tax burden with their portion increasing. I should note that because of the historical growth of the apartment market, both the residential and commercial properties have a smaller portion of the burden than was true just 10 years ago. You can see illustrated in orange in 2013, the apartment properties comprised just over 11% of the total tax capacity. However, now in 2022, they comprise about 20% of the total. Next slide, please. So this slide is a distribution of the estimated market value across the city by ward. The larger the pie, the greater the percentage of total market value that ward is comprised of. It is broken down again into the three major property type categories of apartment, commercial, industrial, and residential. Neighborhoods in and around downtown have a far greater share of the commercial and apartment value in orange and blue while the neighborhoods further away are predominantly residential in green. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the change in total market value by ward. Each ward is represented by a blue bar and the percent of increase is a label at the top of each bar. The wards with the greatest distribution of residential properties are seeing the greatest growth. The three wards in the northern part of the city, wards one, four, and five, are seeing the highest increases in overall value growth. Next slide, please. This is a historical look at the total residential value growth. This year, the overall residential market grew by just under 7%, and this marks the 10th straight year of residential value increases in the city. Next slide, please. While the previous slide illustrates an overall increase for residential properties, this slide further breaks down the data into the three major types of residential properties, condominium townhome, duplex triplex, and single family. Overall, there were increases in the duplex, triplex, and single family submarkets, 
and a decrease in the condominium submarket. This condominium decrease is driven by large complexes in the downtown and uptown markets. It is important to highlight that if you look at all, total all three categories, that there was $360 million in new construction in the residential markets. Next slide, please. Our assessment is very closely scrutinized by the state to ensure accuracy and equity. We follow requirements mandated by the state, which are based on the International Association of Assessing Officers standards on racial studies and mass appraisal. This data again reflects the residential market. The analysis of properties that have, this analysis is of properties that have sold. So what we compare are our assessed values to what they are selling for to analyze how accurate and equitable the values are in comparison to sale prices. The first measurement I will review is the sales ratio, which is the third column. This is a measure of the level of the assessment. It is a comparison of the estimated market value to the sale price of a property. Simply stated, it is the market value divided by the sale price. We use the median ratio as the measure of central tendency. So looking at the bottom row of the nearly 7,000 sales, the median ratio is 95.7. An acceptable median ratio is between 90 to 105 percent. However, to be consistent with surrounding jurisdictions, we typically aim for a median of 95 percent. We don't want to be at a significantly different level of assessment than other jurisdictions in the area. For example, we don't want to be valuing properties at a median of 95 percent when surrounding suburbs or cities are at 90%. Again, the level of assessment needs to be consistent. We have conversations across city borders to assure this consistency. Our assessment meets this ratio requirement. The second measurement is the coefficient of dispersion. It measures the uniformity of the assessment. Essentially, it measures how far away all of the other ratios are from that median of 95.7. An acceptable range for residential properties is less than 15% and we meet this requirement. The last measure, the price related differential is critically important as well because it measures the vertical equity of the assessment. So when low valued properties are valued at a greater percentage of market value than higher valued properties, the assessment is considered regressive. When low valued properties are valued at a lower percentage than high valued properties, the assessment is considered progressive. Assessments for tax purposes should be neither progressive or regressive, and our assessment is within, within the acceptable range for the PRD. Next slide, please. This is a historical look at the required statistical measures that our assessment is judged for accuracy and equity. I would like to point out the significant increase in sales count in the second column with a 34% increase in sales from 21 to 2022. This is the highest volume of sales we have seen going back to 2006. I would also like to recognize the improvement of our statistical measurements, in particular the COD. It has been a focus of our team and continues to improve. And as I mentioned, our assessment is closely scrutinized by the Department of Revenue as they calculate, watch, and analyze these each year as we do. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the comparison of the median sale price, the blue line to the median market value in orange. These lines should be close together and going in the same direction, and you can see that this measurement has also been improving. Our median estimated market value increased 10% from 21 to 2022, increasing from $287,000 to $316,000. Next slide, please. So while the 10% increase in median market value is significant, when you look at surrounding cities and counties, these large increases are consistent with what other assessors are seeing throughout the seven county metro. In fact, the increase in Minneapolis is the lowest in comparison. Next slide, please. This illustrates the breakdown of the residential value changes by the percent change from 2021 to 2022. So nearly 60% of all residential properties saw an increase between 5 and 15%. And you will see that in the orange and the purple bar. 
We are, however, seeing areas in the city that are seeing increases greater than this, which leads us into our next slide, please. Now, this is a map of the single family residential changes by parcel and by ward. You can see um, the key on the left there that is a key to what the colors represent. So while we're seeing increases throughout the city, we are seeing the greatest increases, which would be in blue. Um, they're in the Camden community and along the river in Northeast and along the southern border of the city. Next slide, please. Now this is a geographical representation of the aggregate of all residential changes by neighborhood, including the condominium duplexes and triplexes. So while we're seeing increases in the single family market, as I referenced earlier, we are seeing decreases in the condominium submarket in the downtown and uptown neighborhoods, which you can see here in orange on the map. Next slide, please. Again, this is a ward comparison of residential values in the same statistical measurements we discussed earlier. The columns to the left are the 21 and 22 total market values the amount of new construction and the net change in total value. Then moving across the chart is the median market value, the number of sales in that ward, the median sale price, as well as those statistical measure, measurements. What I want to mention here is the range of sales ratios is 95.3 to 97.2%, indicating that our level of assessment across the city is very consistent. Also, the COD or coefficient of dispersion, which is that measure of uniformity across the city ranges from 5.9 to 7.7, .7, indicating there are uniform assessments across the city as well. To achieve this kind of consistency, larger increases were needed in some neighborhoods because the sale prices were higher than our former 2021 assessment. Next slide, please. Pivoting to the commercial market, Separating commercial from industrial, you will see overall increases in both markets. And if you look at the last column, however, the industrial markets saw a much more significant increase of 14.2% compared to the commercial market increase of 2.8%. Next slide, please. This is the historical look at commercial industrial market values. And while we saw an overall decrease last year, the commercial industrial markets as a whole is trending up again. The aggregate market value of $12.7 billion is approaching the pre-pandemic total of 20 of $12.8 billion from 2020. Next slide, please. While overall the commercial industrial market is trending up again, not every geographical submarket has completely rebounded. This slide separates out the downtown and uptown markets, the commercial markets outside of downtown and uptown, and then the industrial market. You can see here that we are still seeing overall value decreases in the downtown and uptown market locations. Next slide, please. Reviewing the commercial industrial statistics, when the commercial industrial markets are analyzed, separately or independently, they are with all within acceptable range. When combined, we do see that the PRD is slightly out of range and it will be watched for the next assessment year. Next slide, please. Just a quick look at the apartment market. The net increase was just over 5%. There was $653 million in new construction added and all of the statistical measurements are within an acceptable range. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, value notices are in the mail. The notices are color coded in green this year to coordinate with the Hennepin County Initiative to align value notices with tax statements. So next year's 2023 payable tax statement will be coded in green. If property owners have questions or concerns about their value, they should contact the appraiser listed on the back of their notice. If they have questions about their homestead status, they should call or email our office and that contact information is also on the notice. There are resources on our website for property owners that would like to research their property value, including a neighborhood sales finder, neighborhood value change data, a property tax estimator, along with data contained in property info. 
Information about the appeals process is also on the notice and the website. There is also a selection of short videos that explain property values, taxes, and the appeal process, and there is a link to the appeal application. Next slide, please. Again, value notices are in the mail. They went out on time. The local board of appeal and equalization convenes April 18th and, and is scheduled to reconvene on the 19th. And we'll, we will hold more sessions as needed to hear all of the appeals. The Hennepin County Board of Appeal and Equalization convenes on June 13th, which is the next step after the local board and the appeals process. In addition, we have presentations today and tomorrow to the NCR led neighborhood association meetings, and we are planning to start individual neighborhood meetings as well with victory being first this week, and we plan to give a presentation to the Board of Estimate and Taxation in April. We definitely welcome all opportunities to meet with property owners and taxpayers. Next slide, please. As we look to the annual quintile revaluation that we need to complete each year, as, as dictated in statute, we have to look at every property once every five years. The neighborhoods in green will be reviewed by a residential team this year. We have just over 23,000 residential parcels to review and they will be out in the field. We will receive a letter if your property is due for that. Um, they'll be in the field. If you're not home, they will leave a tag to let you know that they were there. And we will provide that information for council to notify our constituents as we get closer to the date. And that concludes our report. In closing, thank you again for your time and a huge thanks to our team in the assessor's office for helping compile this report. Thank you. Thank you. As I um, wait to see who gets in queue, uh, I will s remind colleagues um, and the public that property taxes are certainly an, a major part of our general fund. I think this is a, a really good and important explanation that shows our current tax environment and how that's changing. And thank you for that long look uh, or look back um, as to how we've where we've come from where we've been we have a question or comment from council member goodman thank you madam chair not as much a question as a couple of comments thank you Ms. malmquist for your report um, this report tells us a lot about what's happening in the city and what it tells me is that we have not done enough to help grow the city this screams to me, we need more housing of all types. And the reason for that is because the biggest driver of property taxes for people who are actually living in the city right now is the places where there's higher valuation. Um, a, a, a value increase is not, a, a, the city increasing its levy by 5% does not mean everyone's going to see a 5% tax increase. It's a combination of how much your value is improved over time, even if you're not selling, no matter what your age is or how long you've lived in the city, and the property tax valuation combined with the levy increase. So what Ms. Momquist said, and I'm sure everyone is paying attention to this, that it's going to be especially harsh in the first, fourth, and fifth wards where values have increased by huge numbers. If someone's property increased by 15 or 20% plus the levy increase, they're looking at something very, very significant. And while I'm sure the assessor's office will say, but that's great, your house is worth more. It's not great if you're trying to live there, pay on a daily basis. Uh, the It's like an inflation situation. Your costs are gonna go up because your taxes are gonna go up dramatically in addition to all of the other increases we're seeing as a result of inflation. And one way to deal with this is to build more housing so that we can spread um, out the amount of housing we have in the city by adding units that will help build the tax base and units of all kinds, not just apartments, not just condos. You can see the condo market looks to me to be doing really poorly, uh, probably because people don't feel the value in living downtown when everything is closed and they feel unsafe. But ultimately, we need to build more housing because this 10% increase overall or six to 10% is mainly driven because there are way more buyers than sellers. 
So there's not enough product on the market, which is what's increasing the value, I believe, even higher than probably what values are worth. And one way to deal with that lack of sellers is to add more housing to the market. So this should be a wake up call to us that undeveloped property in the city, um, places where we could add another 100 duplexes, triplexes or single family homes, we should be doing that because we don't have enough inventory. Yes, the suburbs are increasing faster, but we are still increasing quite a bit. And the only way to spread that burden out is to have more growth. And so I, I, I'd be very worried if I represented a ward and part of my ward is seeing tremendous increases. Um, I worry about people who want to stay in their homes and be able to stay in the city pretty much being valued out. They might not think their house is worth that much, but they're only gonna find out if they sell it and then they won't be able to find another house that looks like to me anywhere else in the city or even in the suburbs. So this is a real clear call to us that we need to increase our volume of construction um, so that we can help spread this burden along more people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Momquist, for this um, enlightening uh, presentation. Um, I, I share Councilmember Goodman's uh, concerns about wards one, four, and five, as I am sure the council members from those representing those wards um, share similar concerns as well. You know, um, housing production is um, a major factor in our affordability crisis, um, as well as this this tax burden that is um, seemingly um, hitting these properties um, harder than other parts of the city. Um, I will note that in past years there have been larger increases in in other parts of the city as well. And so it seems like there's some a wave or a balancing act that happens. And hopefully, Ms. Mompos, you can speak to that a little bit. Um, I, but I'm concerned about the, um, or if you can help me understand how commercial properties are seeing a a lower um, increase, and and I, I seemingly have gotten information that it's because of the vacancies that are in the pandemic, but I'm not sure how that relates to um, lowering their property taxes if you know they have lower. Um, vacancies in those buildings. So hopefully you can help me try to understand that as well. And then to the point that um, Council uh, Member Goodman was making, um, many of the homes in this, in those three wards, one, four and five, uh, particularly four and five, are um, owned by uh, multinational investor groups, um, corporate share owner holders, and um, you know, and they pass those increases on to the renters of those single family homes um, and thus exasperating our affordability crisis. So please help me understand the the differentiate the differentiation of commercial properties and how vacancy rates impacts their tax rates. Um, and um, try to address sort of that wave that I mentioned of you know, various different parts of the city seeing these um, increases more so than others.
Madam Chair and Council President Jenkins, thank you for those questions. Um, I think I would, for, if I can first speak to the commercial market and um, what we're seeing as far as actual still some decreases in those markets. So there are three different approaches to value. In addition to sales transactions, we do, there's an income approach which includes um, rent and vacancies. And so we do have to look at um, what is really happening with um, the office buildings that are seeing leases come expired, or leases expiring, maybe not able to fill those spaces again. So there is more vacancy on the market. And we truly don't think that we've seen the end of what this story is going to be as a lot of those leases are five or 10 years and we are going to see what's going to actually happen if somebody's going to fill those spaces. But if a building is significantly um, suffering from some vacancy issues, that does play into the valuation of that property. So I hope that helps a little bit. I mean, we do look at the sales data that comes in. We don't have a lot of downtown sales data. Um, and we've been told over and over again that there is just a lot of money in the market right now and property investors need to invest that money. And so they are paying in some inflated prices based on what the data is telling us. But we also have to look at what's truly happening within each of the buildings across the city. So, so does, that, does that same axiom hold true for vacant residential properties? It would, it would still flex it's empty for two years. Will they have lower taxes? Their valuation may be lower based on the fact that they are struggling with some vacancies, but we would want to know what, what those reasons are. We'd have to analyze that and analyze how that would play into a sale transaction as well. What, what would a buyer looking at that vacant property be willing to pay for that and why is that property vacant? And so that's getting fairly granular into the analysis that each of our appraisers do when they verify all these sales to make sure that we fully understand what's happening with these transactions so that we're only using the true market transactions to help tell the story and we're not inflating values when we shouldn't be. And so I would just speak to the the wards one, four, and five, and then I think I spoke about the Camden community, and then along the um, shore in the northeast, and then the southern border of the city. Um, there's there's just been great demand in those areas, and that is really what's been pushing. Like Council Member Goodman brought up that you know it is a seller's market, and um, people are paying. We've had bidding wars and all of that again, so that is driving the market in some of those areas for sure. Uh, let's see, can you restate, I really apologize, can you restate the wave that you asked about? The right, so it, it seemingly, you know, in, in my first term, um, property values and Southwest uh, Minneapolis were much higher and, and valuations and in the wars that you mentioned were much lower. Uh, and then subsequently um, in, in uh, following years, you know, cent the central city, Ward 8, um, Ward 9, would see significant increases and and those seem to be going out now um ward wards one four and five i mean how how do we kind of i mean beyond the housing shortage et cetera et cetera um is there any rationale for why we're seeing these sort of increases and decreases sort of spread around town? Well, everything that we say is location, 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 and then where are there affordable, 
the affordability of where um, where properties are still at an affordable level, and that is in our one wards one, four, and five right now. And so that is what's driving um, the property value increases, particularly in those areas. Do we have a sense of those? You know, I, I think I mentioned that in those particular wards, one, four, and five, there seems to be a lot of corporate. Do we know the uh, corporate um, entities purchasing these um, single family homes and, and then renting them? Do we have a sense of the numbers in that? At the, at the moment, I don't, but we can definitely put that together and share that. As Thank far you. as how many there are out there that are buying, Typically, they may fall under a couple of different names, but we're learning them better, learning the players better and how many properties they are buying and renting. Then we could tie that in with the rental data to get you what you're looking for, I think. Yeah, no, that would be some really helpful information. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, and your team for um, doing this really um, challenging work and um, very efficiently. So I appreciate the presentation and um, all the efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Goodman. Thank you. I think the council president raises a bunch of interesting questions. I just want to comment on two of them. The assessor's hands are tied. I think it's important to remember that her department's not really one making policy. They're following state law. So we don't have the ability to say, Ms. Momquist, turn a blind eye to the Bryn Mawr neighborhood and pay a lot of attention to North Minneapolis. We're actually required under law to value to 95% of actual market value. And I believe the assessor's office does a tremendously good job of that. Um, and so it's not like we could do anything about this. We have to do things about it on the policy end to try to um, decrease the problem. And that's why I talk about construction. Without question, the demand for homes under $300,000, maybe under $400,000 is bigger than we've ever seen. You know, the pandemic, people don't wanna live in smaller apartments or even condos, they wanna to move to a house. And so that lowest level of the market, and it almost makes me sick to suggest that a $400,000 house would be the lowest level of the market, but the places where those lower level houses are, are where the greatest demand is. It seems these days, regardless of what neighborhood. I'll also note that some of these parts of town had lower valuations due to things like tornadoes and mortgage foreclosures and uh, properties that were valued in the $300,000 range fell to $60,000. So what they've been seeing is a steady increase over time and that's scary to people. And it, it's scary to me, to be fair. I also wanna talk about income-based valuation. I know I'm really geeky and I apologize for this, um, Council Member Palmisano, but income-based valuation is exactly why we implemented the 4D tax program for affordable housing. Assessors were going into buildings and saying to landlords, well, you're only charging $1,000 for this apartment that on the market you could you could get 1500. So I'm going to assess your house based on an income based valuation as though you charged full market value. And our policy action or reaction to that was to say private owners who have no property and or affordable housing will get the benefit of the lower tax rate. And so this is the good appropriate way for us to work hand in hand with the assessor's office to try to determine what policies could help protect those who are being hit the hardest without um, calling out the assessor's office for purposely increasing people's values in order to increase taxes for whatever reason. Um, so I just want to note that when we saw that happen with affordable housing, we did something about it. And I would urge us to be thinking along those lines from a policy point of view in the next year. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, that was certainly the point of my questioning to, to try to understand what potential policies we may be able to employ. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else in queue. Um, you know, assessors don't get much recognition, um, but Ms. Malmquist, you and your team deserve a lot of praise 
for your care and thoughtfulness in being so accurate, your adherence to all of these principles that um, just keep you right in the calculated center of all of this. So thank you so much for um, your efforts. I hope you'll pass our appreciation on to your team. We will do that. Thank you so much for your time and your support. Um, we are in the, the heat of valuation calls and talking with taxpayers and helping educate and provide information about what's going on in the market. And so if you have any constituents that you that need assistance, please send them our way and we are happy to help and provide information about, you know, again, property tax relief programs that they may not be taking a advantage of as well. So just want to provide people all their options. So thank you so much for your time. Yep. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, I'll direct the clerk to file that report. The next two items on our agenda are part of our government structure subcommittee. So moving on to that. Uh, first up, item two is a report from Mayor Fry on his executive reorganization proposal as part of the new uh, voter approved government structure pursuant to Charter Amendment number 184. Um, I think I saw him join, so I'll invite my Mayor Jacob Fry to give us that report. I know that your time is somewhat limited and this is just going to be a high level overview. We'll have a more detailed opportunity, uh, an opportunity to go into more detail at our next Committee of the Whole on April 12th. Welcome, Mayor Fry. Thank you, Council Vice President. You are right. This is somewhat limited. It is a higher level overview, but this is extraordinarily important nonetheless. I'm really grateful to be here today with all of you to present uh, uh, my recommendations for our new structure of government. The form of government, the form our government takes is more important and longer lasting than any program or policy that we could possibly enact. And we're here today because the voters approved charter amendment number 184 in November, which implemented the executive mayor, legislative council government structure in which the mayor is defined as the city's chief executive officer and administrative authority. Uh, so here's how we got there. And then I'd ask for the next slide. Uh, as part of our work to implement that new government structure, we needed to bring a recommendation for reorganization of the executive branch to achieve an operating design that is durable for durable and, and responsive, but also capable of adapting to potential future needs. We want to make sure that it provides effective service delivery, achieves operating efficiencies, and that provides equitable service to all of our residents. And we want to make sure we've imp improved internal and external communication of priorities and initiatives throughout our enterprise. Next slide, please. So on November 29th, 2021, I convened what is called the Government Structure Work Group with the charge of advising me on the implementation of this charter amendment. So the work group met seven times in both December and January for two to three hours each time. Uh, so I'm sorry, that's seven times altogether in December and January. Uh, and in addition to their charge, they sought to achieve the principles that are outlined on this next slide. Um, and so that is uh, the, some of the work group recommendations. And, uh, you, you can see those there before you. So after reviewing systems in multiple jurisdictions, best practices and the law, the work group presented three options. The work group's report was posted on the city's website on March 4th. And then those three options that you should see uh, before you uh, were included in that report. Now here, this, this is important. Importantly, there, there are no differences between these options as it relates to council authority. Under any option, report, reporting structure ultimately flows up to the mayor. Uh, voters chose to change our form of government, and it's now up to us to determine how to most effectively structure it to be as responsive to community needs as possible. Next slide. And so after a whole lot of careful review of the work group's report and then quite a bit of internal development, I'm recommending the third option because it will be most effective in setting the executive branch and the entire city enterprise up for success. The strengths of this approach are that 
It does the following. It allows the mayor to identify key administrative roles that are necessary to support the functioning of the executive mayor. It broadens the input and options presented to the mayor through a small team of top level officials directly responsible to them. And finally, it supports and forms timely attention for certain functions that are prioritized by the mayor or the community. It can elevate departments, the functions that are identified as top priorities as well. So we will be weighing the benefits of this approach as we're uh, as are discussed in great deal in the report. However, I believe that the third option provides the best balance for span of control, for organizational clarity, and then ultimately for durability. Next slide, please. So what you see on your screen is a high level organizational chart. There are four direct reports to the mayor, a chief administrative officer, the city attorney, a chief community safety officer, and then the mayor's chief of staff. This proposed structure would ensure clear lines of authority, delegation, span of control, and then ultimately communication between these departments where at times we did have more of a siloed approach. It ensures that the mayor has the support of high level administrators to oversee the efficient and effective functioning of our municipal government while aligning our work in a way that makes sense to residents and provides clarity and accountability for decision making. Under the structure, the mayor should reserve the right to prioritize specific areas to the level of their leadership team as city needs would dictate. The mayor is still able to reach out to a department head within the organizational structure that may not be a direct report as listed on that chart. The structure beyond the two core supporting roles of CAO and then CCSO uh, would remain fluid and responsive to the needs of the day. Um, that is chief administrative officer and chief community safety officer. Uh, the city's uh, structure should foster and support effective relationships between the mayor and the city council and then ultimately increase accountability, clarity and communication and equity in provision of these city services. Next slide, please. So at its core, this structure relies on the establishment uh, of a professional CAO position to handle the primarily internal day to day operations of the city. Along with the chief of staff, which is in the mayor's office, these result, these roles are intended to aid the mayor in carrying out elected duties as efficiently and effectively as possible. Consolidating the operational departments under one office will enhance accountability. It could break down some silos and it can also provide collaborative approaches to our community's complex challenges. Uh, the structure also provides a pathway for succession planning and a continuity of government services, regardless of the administration. Next slide. So this is the Office of Community Safety. This is a major moment for unity in the city of Minneapolis. An opportunity to fundamentally redefine our local government's role in upholding and developing community safety while establishing clear lines of accountability for the important work of keeping Minneapolis residents safe. The proposed Office of Community Safety fully integrates our safety work as a, as a city and elevates the work of, for instance, the Office of Violence Prevention to the Department of Neighborhood Safety. By the way, all these name, names could change. And that would be in recognition of its increased responsibility within this structure. No matter where you stood on question two, this proposal presents an opportunity for unity. Most people who opposed question two didn't oppose it because they were against an integrated safety system or mental health responders. I, for instance, opposed it because of the 14 bosses structure, which importantly is not present here. For those that were in favor of question two, this approach centralizes and integrates our community safety work for a stronger system of public safety, a message that was broadly embraced. This proposal centers items of agreement and common ground, which is an integrated approach. We can come together and agree on an integrated approach. 
safety beyond policing and alternative response. We should be able to agree on that. Accountability in central reporting structure, there again. This proposal does not touch police staffing levels. It does not add elected officials to the chain of command. So for the better part of now two years, this city has been engaged in debate around transforming public safety. This is a chance to do more than talk about it. This is our chance to make good on enacting change that can and should, and I hope will, last generations. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of meeting this moment of unity, with unity, to do right by our residents and businesses served by our government today and those who will be served for many, many years into the future. Our form of government, it should transcend any policy or any program. It should transcend any politician or department head. And seeing the foundation for how our city will function now for generations to come, that's got to be the goal here. So let's install a structure of government for generations. Let's do this right. Let's do this together, council members. I look forward to working with you. This is the broad overarching uh, presentation here, uh, and I'll turn it back to you, Council Vice President. Thank you. And thank you for coming uh, for this presentation. Um, I, I know this will take a bit to digest, and I know this is just a first look. Um, there's a lot of questions and thoughts, but just um, if you have just a few more minutes, Mayor, we have a few kind of initial takes and we'll just see um, what my colleagues have to say. Councilmember Osman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mayor, for uh, uh, coming today and talking to us and giving that presentation. And I really want to thank the work group that with time and effort to come uh, to this recommendation. I understand that uh, President in Minneapolis uh, chose to change the government structure, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, we will come up with a plan that will better our uh, city in the future. Um, my question is, how is this structure help me do my job better and provide services that my community and my residents deserve? Um, and this model of structure, um, I came from a world that um, that are, you know, many communities that are here that really deserve services, city services, and that um, as I talk to different departments and staff, I'm always striving to making their life better. So how would this structure help me um, do better and deliver services that they deserve? Madam Vice President, uh, Council Member Osman, thank you for the question. What this structure would do is streamline city services, provide greater efficiencies, and make sure that there's, there is uniformity in terms of transparency, accountability, and ultimately chain of command and direction. Uh, the As question one outlined, uh, Council Members are properly legislators. They, they deliberate, they think things through, they do public engagement, they pass laws, uh, and then ultimately in setting both up a government as well as delivering the city services, council members and the, and the mayor's office should work together to provide the best possible service for the unique needs of your ward. I believe that this structure does it. Uh, now, notably, there's always a balance in how we set up this reporting structure. Importantly, this was not a question as to whether the council or the mayor has more authority. This was a question largely as to how and how many uh, people report up to the mayor's office. This is not just me, this will be many, many mayors well into the future. Uh, and it's a balance. You wanna have enough uh, direct reports so that you're able to provide specific direction to a number of people. However, you don't want too few reports so that there are bottlenecks, which we have seen in other cities and in other government structures. Uh, this. Uh, was the policy that provides and strikes that that balance to to hopefully be durable well into the future. Thank you. Councilmember Wansley Warloba. 
Thank you, Council Vice President Palmasano, and thank you for this presentation, Mayor Fry. Um, as some of my colleagues know, um, at the POGO meeting right before this meeting, it's been a full day for all of us. Uh, I introduced the staff directive building upon uh, Council Member Payne's charter amendment proposal uh, to further flush out what a Department of Public Safety could entail. And in my comments, I raised that, you know, being intentional about implementing this new department, um, having staff lay out a comprehensive analysis of what it looks like to implement it, and particularly with the face in approach of MPD. And we introduced uh, the staff directive that's going to be postponed to the next cycle um, under the guise that, you know, in 2021, and I'm glad you named this of reference to question two, but in 2021, you know, we had this robust public conversation about whether or not law enforcement or MPD should actually be included in that Department of Public Safety. And I think we always hear time and time again, like voters made it very loud and clear on November 2nd that they did not want that. So I'm somewhat concerned, is this Office of Community Safety a rebrand of question two, which will essentially override the will of voters? Council Vice President, Council Member Robin Wamsley, I think that's far and away overly simplistic. Uh, there were many different facets of question two, some that I, and I'm speaking for myself here, supported, some that I did not. Uh, as I said repeatedly throughout the campaign, I support an integrated approach to public safety. I support coordination between these multiple entities, be they mental health responders, the Office of Violence Prevention, the Office of Emergency Management, fire or police. The coordination is essential. The pieces that I felt strongly that were, should not move forward uh, was the 14 boss issue. This does not have that. And so, no, it is not the same as question two. I do believe that it takes items where there is broad consensus and it takes out pieces where there wasn't. Um, now, in terms of inclusion of police in the department, Absolutely, I believe they should be included because this has to be a comprehensive approach. If we believe that police are a part, not the whole thing, but a part of a comprehensive community system, then we need to make sure that police officers and the department are collaborating and working with the other entities that are also providing public safety service. I've heard time and time again from residents throughout our city I've heard internally the issue of having MPD off on an island, siloed off from the other work. The whole point of this has always been, I believe, to further and properly integrate the approach. This is a moment of unity that I think we can all rally around. Again, will every single side be thrilled? No, but this takes the, the pieces where there is broad consensus and it puts it in a plan that I think is very functional, that is forward thinking and will allow us to deliver better, more coordinated and more integrated services that provides the specific tools for the specific needs that we do in fact see on the ground throughout our city. Thank you, Mayor Fry, for providing that. Um, would love to talk more with you about what metrics you would like to see um, MPD fall under um, as you're trying to integrate it into this new department. As we know, there's lots of this functionality around MPD right now. Um, I'm glad you referenced the point about the 14 bosses because under this proposal, it seems like city council would still maintain legislative authority over all departments that are included in this new, you know, Office of Community Safety, except MPD. Wouldn't have, wouldn't having MPD in the same department with others that have different accountability and reporting structures lead to the same concerns that you've raised around 14 bosses. Like for example, if the city council passes policies around this new community, uh, sorry, Office of Community Safety, especially around standards um, and how it conducts itself when interacting with the community, will these policies also apply to MPD or would they be exempted from it? Council Vice President, Council Member Wamsley, First off, I don't want to speak to the conclusions without consulting and getting the direction specifically from the city attorney. Uh, all of these are items that I believe that we are going to need to be working out. Does council have general legislative authority? Of course, that is the case. 
Does the charter itself explicitly uh, provide control over MPD to the mayor? That is also the case. So, you know, I, what I would say is, is we should talk with, with the attorneys who, and, and the clerk who have a deeper understanding of, of the charter itself, just to make sure that I'm not giving you any incorrect information here. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Uh, another question, because your answer basically confirms that this new department that will include MPD and other charter departments, like it will basically not allow for a uniform application of policies because city council does not have legislative authority to change the policies over MPD. So it, it does seem like that kind of conflicts in with your prior comments. I'm not sure how my prior comments conflicted with with anything, Council Member Wamsley, uh, but I do think we should talk to the city attorney to make sure that we're getting this right. Awesome. And again, just wanted to know this is why I, you know, move forward with including that staff director because that staff director would have had the opportunity to, it still does, um, to actually do an analysis of all the departments, including getting counsel from our, you know, city attorneys around we can how we can actually have a good implementation process, which doesn't seem to be provided in the context of this proposal. Um, but just for last sake of clarity, can you provide more cl uh, clarity on the reporting structures of MPD within this new uh, Office of Community Safety? Basically, who will MPD report to? Uh, first, what you just said is entirely inaccurate, Council Member Wamsley. So this is a proposal that we are providing to you now. And then over the next several weeks and months, not only there will there be additional analysis, but we can also work out the details. We are providing to you in transparent form in a public way, the basics of how I am recommending the new structure of government. A lot of that still needs to be worked out. Um, and so like your staff direction doesn't have any metrics, doesn't have any plan, doesn't have anything more than the basic proposal, we have provided a, an extensive report provided by the work group, and we've provided the basic framework through which we're looking to get set up. But yes, there are still some details to be set out. I think that is entirely consistent. Just to be clear, this yeah. is really meant to just be a real high level overview. So I want to just allow us to, you know, touch high level and I'm going to move on so that we get to the other two in queue before the mayor has to leave. Council member Chavez. Oh, uh, Council Vice President, just that last question, because um, I didn't ask for accuracy of the the staff directive or implementation of the department. I asked if who would be reported, like the reporting structure of MPD, and it does sound like Mayor Fry has some thoughts on that based off of what he's presented. Um, yes, it's clear to me that this structure also preserves the position of Chief of Police uh, and that they, this position reports directly to the mayor and will continue to do so. Is that correct, Mayor Fry? That is correct under the charter. There is a proposal here on the page which you can see which has an, an individual uh, that could ultimately manage and coordinate between the separate entities below. Um, again, I hesitate to, to, to give explicit uh, an explicit case on the on the charter just because I think we need to make sure that, that it's accurate. I don't want to say something that is inaccurate to you. Thank you. Council Member Chavez. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Fry and staff for working hard on this. I know it's not easy work, so I do appreciate that. Uh, I do know that the ninth ward, only 37% of my ward voted in favor of this new government structure. And part of that is because the complexities of creating a new government structure can and will be. I know that I represent the most diverse ward in the city. It is very immigrant heavy, has the biggest undocumented community in the state, the biggest Latinx community in the entire state, a growing East African community, and the biggest urban indigenous community. And part of that is because they don't know what this new government structure will be and the implications of racial and immigrant justice that needs to be implicated on this. So my question, I have two of them. What racial justice analysis or work have we done to make sure that this specific government structure as we move forward or what are we going to do moving forward to ensure that people that live in my ward specifically and of wards across the city that are immigrant majority or people of color majority aren't being left behind by new government structure that can leave people behind. Council Vice President Lene Palmasano, Council Member Chavez, uh, one of the key pieces that we were looking to enact through this reporting structure uh, was to ensure that services could be provided in an equitable fashion across the city, not just to where most complaints were issued, not just to those that had a council member that 
perhaps had more ins with city staff or was more willing to go beyond the department head to get what they wanted. The whole purpose here is to be able to provide service in an equitable fashion uh, across uh, our entire city, regardless of zip code or neighborhood. Now, none of this uh, dictates the outcome of question one. Question one was determined on November 2nd. Um, so to the extent that there are disagreements about that, those disagreements are fair, but those questions have been asked, those questions have been answered, and now it's our job to, to move forward with a reporting structure uh, that does flow up to a mayor uh, to ensure that services can be properly met. Um, so now there's going to be a lot that happens uh, over these next several weeks uh, through April 12th, and we'll also need to be patient. Uh, we are changing what has been a like 100 year government structure. Uh, inevitably, there will be bumps. Portions of this will be clunky, uh, but you know, I make, think it makes sense to, to get this right. Uh, and so that's what's going to happen over the next several weeks. Uh, and of course, we would uh, welcome uh, feedback. And I look forward to working with all of you to ultimately get a new structure approved. And importantly, it's not whether we approve a, a new government structure, it's it's just how we do so. Um, uh, many of these questions have already been answered. Thank you, Mayor. And I would just um, ask that as we move forward with this, as I know there's going to be a lot of work ahead of us, that we put it through our race equity committee to make sure that we do have the city council has an opportunity to review it within race equity lens as we move forward. Um, I'm the vice chair of the committee and President Jenkins is the chair. I think that would be very helpful as we move forward as the council approves this. And then my last question is in regards to interactions with city staff, which I know our city staff have worked really hard here throughout the years. Uh, that being said, in January, a lot of city staff were told that they couldn't meet with certain council members or were told that they couldn't meet with some council members. How will we ensure that this new government structure allows us for us to meet with city staff or what is the role of council members to be able to meet with city staff as we move forward? Councilmember Chavez, um, how city staff interact with the council is really part of the next presentation because it's about how we do our work. So Mayor Fry, you're welcome to respond if you want, but that's really the whole top, a big part of the topic of the next part of the presentation that we're going to need to get to soon here. Mayor Fry, did you want to add anything? I think that's accurate. Thank you, Council Vice President. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Council Member Johnson because I promised him an opportunity to also um, comment or ask a question before we move on. Go ahead, Council Member. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the presentation on this. I had uh, two fairly quick questions. One, I think I've mostly pieced together in terms of uh, I believe the process will be discussed more at the next committee of the whole, but I don't know if you wanted to elaborate any more on just the generally the process for working with the council on some of these details uh, kind of around timeline or just expectations around how we work through these. Council Vice President, Council Member Johnson. Uh, so yes, over the next several weeks and in fact months, we will be working both with city staff as, as well as working with council members to determine the, the final structure and some of the specifics that have not been laid out in this overarching uh, plan. Um, uh, if, if Mr. Carl, I don't know if you have uh, you know more of a timeline to present. I know that we're coming back on April 12th. Um, some of the rest of the timeline, well, some of the timeline is, is to be dictated by council. Um, but uh, Mr. Carl, if, if you could roll that out a bit. Yeah, Madam um, we're really trying to do all of our work in public here. So the work of this committee is really being done out here in front of all of you as um, we do these government structure, all this work at committee. So um, Mr. Carl, did you want to give some further detail and just kind of if we stay on track here where we might land in terms of decision making points? Madam Vice President, thank you. And to the mayor's point, Councilmember Johnson, I would suggest that one of the things I'm going to be saying in my presentation next is that we are anticipating a series of recurring or repetitive meetings in front of this uh, government structure subcommittee of Cal so that both policymakers and the public can use this committee meeting as a tracking point. So that presentations on the status of implementation about key decisions that need to be made about um, ordinances that will be to introduce uh, and be hashed out between the mayor and the council with input from professional staff would all happen at this uh, committee meeting so that there is a consistent uh, 
both a consistent rhythm to those presentations, but also one location where the public and policymakers can uh, be sure to track the changes as they're being made. Thank you. I appreciate the answer on that. And, and that really leads into my uh, other question, which I think is probably one of those details that will work out at a future meeting. But Mr. Mayor, I was just curious when looking at the reporting structure, uh, I know that right now we have a lot of uh, hearings, for instance, on appointments for department heads. Uh, this would be you know, putting a lot of those department heads uh, today that we have hearings for under uh, one leader or commissioner or director or whatever the title is. Uh, do you anticipate that we would still have public hearings on those uh, department leaders for some of these large departments? Or is that a detail TBD based off of further refinement and conversation? Council Vice President, Council Member Johnson, it, it's a good question and on that topic, I, I'm not anticipating anything. Uh, in other words, uh, I think that is a topic that we all need to kind of go through as we figure out the best way to set up a new structure of government. You know, you want to depoliticize a lot of these decisions. You want to give as much uh, oversight and, and ability to make timely and efficient decisions to some of these department heads as possible. And at the same time, I understand the council has a role of oversight. Uh, and so let's let's work together on this. That would be my ask. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Fry, for joining us today. Um, I do want to lift up, as the council president did in the chat, um, to affirm Council Member Chavez's concern about how this impacts our race equity goals and to consider things through that lens as we move forward. So um, thank you. I know that we'll do that in future discussions. Um, and we have a new race equity director um, starting soon, I think. So thank you for your time today. We will see you again at a future um, government structure subcommittee meeting here. Seeing no further discussion because the mayor has to go, I will direct the clerk to file that report. Um, our final agenda item, number three, is a report on the roles and responsibilities of the executive mayor and legislative council under the new government structure pursuant to charter amendment number 184. So we just heard the mayor on the executive side proposal and now we're going to hear from the city clerk on kind of how we work together with the, that executive side and also go into some detail on the legislative side, which is the part that we get to, um, you know, implement based on this new government structure. So I'll invite Casey Carl to give that report. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm here as mentioned to provide a second presentation about the work to implement the executive mayor legislative council structure that voters approved this past November. This is a follow up to the first presentation this subcommittee received on February 8th. I want to begin by acknowledging there are a wide variety of issues to be addressed. Um, I appreciate the body has just received the mayor's proposal to organize the executive branch. My presentation will not speak specifically to the mayor's proposal. Obviously, we'll need time to evaluate and react to that proposal from the mayor. As I noted earlier, staff does anticipate a series of regular presentations to this subcommittee for the rest of this year as we continue the work as an enterprise uh, on implementation. So today I wanted to continue our discussion about roles and responsibilities of mayor and council in this system of shared powers. Again, this is a follow up to some of the initial concepts that were raised at our first presentation in February. Uh, uh, to help clarify those roles and responsibilities, we've added a briefing memo to your file in LIMS. Uh, it was also circulated to all council members. That memo is entitled Knowing Your Lane, Executive versus Legislative in a System of Shared Powers. I'm going to be pulling um, some details from that memo, but I won't be going into extensive detail in this presentation. That memo does respond to some of the issues and concerns that were raised at that February 8th presentation be using some of the key points in the memo to address recommendations about how council can leverage the city's administration to support its official and legitimate functions. And then we'll conclude with some next steps as the council vice president indicated. So we'll move forward to the next slide. Uh, here you can see a timeline thus far. I think it's good to level set expectations about the work that's required to implement a completely new system of government. I heard council member Chavez mention this. Um, it isn't something that's gonna be accomplished in a short period of time. I think we all uh, appreciate that. 
In fact, in our discussions with other cities that have already undergone similar restructurings of their government, the consistent feedback that we've received at the staff level is that we should expect full implementation will take a few years. Uh, while a majority of the changes, the structural changes, can certainly be completed in the first year, it is inevitable that we'll be addressing implementation over many years, as there are some things, some decisions and some actions that the government only takes up every few years. So some examples of that might include, we just finished redistricting, uh, the production of a new comprehensive plan, the timing of elections, and also subsequent changes in administration. So those are a few examples that talk about the need uh, for a multi-year approach. The core plan, however, for the new government structure was the basic strong mayor model that's found in other cities. That plan is based on a separation of legislative and policymaking functions and the executive and administrative functions that are now under an elected chief executive officer. Beyond those very basic elements of the standard plan, the amendment that voters approved left the details of implementation and administration to the elected mayor and council. So those details are what we're going to be discussing today and what we will be discussing in the weeks and months ahead. We plan to continue pulling on the lessons that have been learned and best practices shared with us from our peer cities so that we can proactively plan for those issues and provide recommendations to policymakers. Today, as we get started, I wanna remind everyone that we're just a little bit over 100 days into our new government structure. So that's just a little more than three months since the new structure became effective on December 3rd last year. Since that time, we closed out the last term, we transitioned to the new term, we oriented our newly elected officials, we coordinated the physical transition and completed organization of the council. Council itself has only completed a total of four meeting cycles, so we're still very early in the process. Today's second presentation about government structure has included the mayor's proposal to organize the administration, and it will include now a continued conversation about roles and responsibilities of the mayor and council. What we won't be discussing today, but I think it's important for council to know, are the multiple internal meetings that are ongoing and are intended to address how to improve our operations as a city enterprise. I want you to know that all departments are engaged regularly in discussions about how the city can improve its performance. Some of the recommendations I'll present today reflect the work of those departments in terms of how we can improve our connections and work between the council and administration. I also wanna take uh, just a moment to highlight a new website where the city is providing details about the new government structure. The public can learn more about this new structure and about the latest actions that we're taking to implement the new structure from this site. We're working to ensure that all of the most current and accurate information is posted here. So we want to encourage the community to check the site frequently. You can search under government structure from the city's homepage or simply enter in this direct address, minneapolismn.gov forward slash government forward slash structure. So of course, as we've previously explained, Charter Amendment number 184 established a new form of government in Minneapolis, one referred to as the Executive Mayor Legislative Council structure. Theoretically, this structure is based on a separation of powers model, as I have explained previously, which is similar to what's in place at federal and state levels of government. A strict interpretation of the separation of powers doctrine is predicated on the idea that each branch of the government has a unique and an exclusive set of powers, that these powers are distinct and that the powers are to be exercised independently. However, in several cases, courts have recognized that clear cut distinctions between executive and legislative functions is neither possible nor is it necessarily practical. Instead, courts have concluded that what a separation of power structure actually envisions is a system in which powers are shared. There is a separation, but also interdependence between the government branches. There is some level of autonomy in terms of assigned roles and responsibilities, but there is also a great deal of reciprocity. That means that each branch of the government has a core zone of authority in which that particular branch has the primary legal authority and responsibility. In those areas, it plays the dominant or leading role. But the checks and balances that are built into the system of government means that the other branch has a corresponding role to play. For example, we refer to appointments to be made by the mayor. However, the city charter doesn't actually use the term appoint or appointment in connection with the mayor's responsibility with respect to appointments of certain administrative officials. Instead, the city charter in section 8.4B1 
clearly expresses that the mayor has the exclusive power to nominate these officers. The charter gives the council a role in checking the mayor's authority by requiring that those nominations receive the consent of the council. So a mayoral nomination that receives the consent of the council results in an appointment. It takes both sides of that equation to achieve the outcome. The mayor lacks any legal authority to simply make an appointment. However, as is true in almost every case, where the executive fails to act, the council, as the legislative governing body, may, in certain circumstances, appoint those administrative officials even without a nomination by the mayor, and that's provided in the charter. It's a key point for us to remember. The ultimate and final legal authority of the entire city is vested in the city council. The council has certain expressed and implied powers and authority under state law, under city charter, and under our local core codes, ordinances, and policies. It also holds all residual power that's not expressly assigned to another elected official, an officer, a department, or a board or commission. In other words, the basic assumption is that the council holds final authority for the city government except where the law specifically delegates or assigns that responsibility and power to a different officer, to a different official, to a different board, commission, or department, which includes the mayor. But the mayor, the boards and commissions, and the departments have only those expressly delegated powers or authorities that are given to them under the law. As the League of Minnesota Cities has expressed in its handbook, the cornerstone of city government is the elected city council. Mr. Clerk, um, could, I could I interrupt for a question or, or question comment question from, from Council President Jenkins? Thank you, uh, Madam, uh, Chair. Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Carl, Carl, does that, um, does that, you just talked about um, nominations from the mayor, yeah. the, would that, um, uh, relate to the four departments that the mayor is um, proposing at this particular time? Uh, with, those, with those quote department heads, I guess, um, be required to be um, nominated and subsequently appointed by the council. Madam Vice President, Madam President, those are issues I, I would uh, echo the mayor on this. There are technical terms within the charter that describe which positions constitute an administrative official. And so as the mayor and council work together to implement a new structure, part of the work of the attorney's office will be to help us identify who those administrative officials are, how they're appointed, which would require a nomination by the mayor and the council. So without specifically addressing uh, questions about the table of organization the mayor presented, I would say that the question about which nominations come forward for council's confirmation is yet to be decided, but is a key issue the attorneys will give uh, legal opinions on. Thank you, sir. Uh, if it's okay, Madam Vice President, I'll push forward. I was mentioning that the uh, assumption is that the city council is the cornerstone of city government holds not only expressed and implied powers, but all residual powers that are given to the government under state law. That concept is covered in greater depth on pages two and three of the briefing memo that I mentioned earlier. The point I wanted to reemphasize here is that in almost all aspects of city government, power is not consolidated in either the mayor or the council. Instead, it's shared between them. And what the Charter Amendment did in creating this new form of government was to expressly give the mayor a defined role and certain core responsibilities, as well as the formal authority to discharge those duties as the city's chief executive officer. So the next slide has a chart that I wanna share, and we've seen it before. Uh, this chart illustrates some of the core municipal functions and how they are separated in this new structure between the Legislative Council, which is displayed on the left, and the executive mayor, which is displayed on the right. And while it's a bit difficult to read the entire slide, you can see we've shown distinctions between the two branches with respect to representation, legislation and local policies, uh, municipal finance, operations and personnel, uh, land use, development and zoning, as well as continuity of government and administrative oper or emergency operations. 
uh, based on research, interviews, and lessons learned from comparable uh, municipal jurisdictions, as well as the federal and state governments, we know that this type of division between legislative and executive functions is generally understood in the majority of these key core functions. Um, inevitably, however, the greatest likelihood for challenges and conflicts falls into this category that's now circled on the slide, um, dealing with operations and personnel. In some ways, it's probably because this category is where the action of government takes place. This is where policies are implemented and enforced, where programs are delivered, services are provided. It's where the community interfaces with government and how they experience it, whether for good or bad. In more common parlance, this is the area where the rubber hits the road. And it's the area that the city charter has now specifically assigned the primary role and responsibility to the mayor as the single biggest change under the new government structure. The council's responsibilities are a bit removed. The council takes less of a hands-on approach, but it still retains core responsibilities for defining the mission and functions of the government, for structuring its operation, its financing, its strategic priorities and goals, and the outcomes that are to be achieved. But it does not direct, organize, coordinate, supervise, or control the operations of the enterprise. Those functions have been given to the mayor, specifically under the city charter. The mayor, as the city's chief executive officer, then plays key roles both in the policy making arena, which is where the council is, as well as in the policy implementation and enforcing arena where the city's departments are. The mayor essentially acts as the bridging element between the council and between the city's departments that are part of the city's administration. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, another chart attempting to provide a little bit more clarity. Here you can see the legislative branch on the left side of the slide and the executive branch on the right side. You see that the mayor is positioned in the middle column, bridging between those two functions, between the legislative and the executive functions of the city's administration. If we advance a bit, you'll see here in blue, the legislative council is focused primarily on policy making functions. And these are issues primarily addressed through questions starting with what. For example, what is the core purpose of the mission of government? What are the strategic priorities and goals for this term, for the next decade, for longer? What is the best operating structure for the enterprise to achieve those expressed goals? What are the values that shape this community and must be reflected in its public policies? What is a reasonable rate to underwrite the government's operations and what level of taxation is tolerable and sustainable? And finally, what level of service is expected for the community and its various constituencies? The city's governing body, which makes those determinations, which is a combination of both the council and the mayor, have the responsibility for addressing these very broad framing issues that define and provide the highest level direction for the city government. This work actually constitutes the heart of the policymaking process, and this is where the council plays the leading role. The executive branch on the other side of this chart, also the administration, which encompasses all of our operating departments, is focused on those functions of policy implementation and policy enforcement. Here, the issues are primarily addressed through questions starting with how. For example, how will strategic goals and priorities be expressed, interpreted, and pursued? How will policies be implemented, monitored, evaluated, and reported? How will departments be held accountable for performance from top leadership through to the frontline workers delivering city service? And how will city funds be allocated to finance operations adequately to the standards set by the governing body? In addition, questions that are addressed by the executive include the details of operations. This includes, for example, scheduling and time-related matters, where and other location-based issues, questions about cost and control and how much is appropriate to collect for city functions, and especially issues about the assignment of functions internally to various departments and divisions. And as I noted earlier, the mayor, as you can see, has uh, key responsibilities in each of these separate sides. The mayor is required under the charter to provide policy recommendations in the interests of the city's general welfare, health and safety and development, and to propose a financing plan to pay for the city's operations, which means that the mayor has an initiating role in the major policy making functions of the city, but those are subject to the consideration and action of the council. 
The mayor, of course, has an ability to approve or veto the official actions of the council, which means that the mayor plays a strong counterbalance to the council's legislative functions. But that power of the mayor is checked by the fact that a supermajority of the council can always override the mayor in determining city policies and priorities. And once those policies or priorities are set, the mayor is responsible for the major work of implementing and enforcing the council's policies and decisions, for evaluating and reporting on the work of the city's administration, and for taking accountability for that performance. So in truth, it is the interplay of these three separate overlapping lanes, if you will, that is more relative to the actual system of uh, structure of shared powers under this new government structure. As this chart shows in the background there, um, the division between legislative and executive sides between policy making and policy implementation are very nuanced. Um, this distinction is very fluid. It's a matter of degree and gradation and not so much a stark contrast. This model attempts to diagram those separate lanes of legislative, executive, and operations from council, mayor, and to departments. But in this model, formal power tracks from the council on the left and then over and down through departments on the right. But you can see there's a curved line in the middle of that chart. And that curved line down the middle is meant to show that the dynamic interplay between those lanes is fluid. So council does take the lead and it plays the largest role in terms of the mission and policy making functions. And the departments play the largest role in terms of administration and management. The council has a significant impact on administration and management and the departments influence and help inform the mission and policy decisions of the council. So neither of those sides is completely divorced from any aspect of the total scope of municipal operations. These three separate lanes that I've presented in this model help explains the checks and balances back and forth between the council, the mayor, and the departments. And I hope what you can see is that all players are compelled to pursue a very close working relationship with the other actors. If they work at cross purposes, the result will be political infighting, government paralysis, loss of public uh, confidence, poor service delivery, and worse. Respecting these separate lanes defined between legislative council and executive mayor is important because it helps us ensure the city enterprise is able to function effectively, that it's able to achieve its mission and defined purposes efficiently, and that municipal policies, programs, and priorities equitably reflect and serve all communities in Minneapolis. I wanna credit my partner who's missing from today's presentation, our city coordinator, Heather Johnston, for that structure or that framework, which I call the three E's. It provides a very nice framework, in my opinion, for understanding government structure and the major goals that the administration has identified. And those include effectiveness, efficiency, and equity. In the end, of course, the most effectively governed cities, regardless of structure, are those in which the council and mayor find and focus on common ground and an agenda of shared priorities that advance the long-term needs of the community. And what we're discussing now is the government structure that Minneapolis voters have chosen for themselves. To achieve that level of partnership that's required to serve the people of Minneapolis effectively, efficiently, and equitably, it's critical that the council, the mayor, and all departments understand and respect their roles and responsibilities, that they know and respect their separate lanes, and that they proactively collaborate in articulating and achieving shared goals. So this slide reflects the table of organization under the executive mayor structure. Uh, forgive me, this is the structure that is in place as of December 3rd. I know it doesn't reflect what the mayor just presented as his proposed plan, but this is the structure of the organization as it exists today, uh, effective as December 3rd, 2021. At the top, you can see the mayor and council will advance one click. Uh, as far as we've discussed thus far in the process, we focused on this executive branch shown in the blue triangle under the mayor. Uh, even today, the mayor has presented a proposal on how to restructure this part of the city's organizational chart. Uh, I want to be clear, that plan will need to be worked out between the mayor and the council before it's being finalized. The charter does give to the council final authority for structuring the government, and it will require a number of charter and code amendments um, and those amendments will be the focus of the work we do in the weeks and months ahead. What we haven't addressed much to this point uh, is the legislative branch, what's shown in green here. This relates to the city council and its functions and its support requirements. 
Um, as you can see, the official and legitimate functions of the council include the enactment of local legislation to govern the community, the adoption of public policies to direct the city enterprise, oversight of the city administration to evaluate its performance, and representation, including service to constituents. These are the functions the charter specifically carves out for the council. But to perform these functions effectively, efficiently, and equitably, the council must have access to and support from the city's operating departments, those shown in blue. That's where the subject matter expertise and experience is found. In the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on recommendations for how we can structure those interactions between council and those operating departments, and also highlight the next steps for considering the creation of a legislative department to support the council. So as noted earlier, this is an area where there is the potential for greatest risk in terms of challenges, and that's in the area of operations and personnel. And that's what we're going to refer to broadly as the city administration. Now that the mayor has presented his proposal for how to organize the administration, we need also to consider how council relates to that structure and how we can formalize both processes and systems that will ensure effective and efficient interactions between the council and those operating departments. Of course, the charter does include a very broad prohibition against any interference by the council, by its committees, or by council members in the mayor's direction and supervision of the administration, as shown on this slide. And this restriction forces us to consider some questions about how the council can perform its official and legitimate functions effectively, since it will of necessity depend on, as I said earlier, the expertise and experiences of the operating departments to inform its policymaking work. In addition, if the council cannot draw on those operating departments to support its work, it will be compelled to recreate those departments that are currently under the mayor under the council's authority. And that would be highly inefficient, exorbitantly expensive, and not a sustainable model. So in the end, both the mayor and the council share an interest in making sure that these departments are available to support the council and that it's what is expected by the community. How we design and implement those systems to support those interactions is something we need to develop. We have recommendations that we think will uh, support those needs that we're going to be presenting in the next several slides. Based on Council's direction, we recommend that the agreed procedures and systems be codified in formal city policy so that all parties can access, understand, and abide by these provisions. So at the outset, I'll be clear, we're recommending that the Council give direction to the coordinator and clerk to bring back a draft policy that would codify these agreed elements of the recommendations I'm about to share. These recommendations reflect lessons learned and best practices from other jurisdictions, as well as feedback from the professionals in our own operating departments. So on the next slide, we've attempted to capture visually uh, what I'm referring to as the request, refer, and respond model. This model includes the following features. First, it establishes a consistent means of receiving, prioritizing, managing, and processing requests from the council. Second, it provides a dependable structured method for council to bring forward requests related to its policy proposals to ensure that all council members are equally informed about these proposals, about work that's being done on those proposals, and about any answers or information provided in response to those requests. Third, it creates a way for the administration to respond to informal requests for information by individual council members, either for themselves or made on behalf of their constituents. And finally, it assures accountability throughout the system, which contributes to council's oversight functions. The system would do this by classifying requests by type, whether formal or informal. It would ensure that all formal requests are logged and tracked ensuring that stakeholders are informed and accountable for response. All departments would be involved or impacted by the request and they would all be engaged in generating responses to provide answers or to offer recommendations to each request. And that process of the internal referral would be centrally managed by the city coordinator. Requests would be resolved by providing accurate, relevant, and timely responses or even by offering recommendations that might be necessary to achieve stated goals or desired results. And finally, responses to all formal requests would be shared with the mayor and all council members to ensure that loops are closed with our elected policymakers. 
a key to this proposal is the classification of requests shown on this slide. So here you can see there are basically two classes of request, a formal request and an informal request. A formal request shown on the left here is almost always going to be tied to policy making and oversight functions of the council. Requests that pertain to the initiation of new policies, programs, or projects, or research to support the scope of work um, tied to those new policies, programs, and projects would constitute a formal request. Similarly, requests that inquire into the status of existing policies, programs, and projects, or which relate to the council's oversight work to evaluate the administration's performance would constitute a formal request. An informal request would relate to a request for existing or easily obtainable data or information, whether for a council member or for their constituents. These requests generally would consume five hours or less to research, pull together, compile, and complete. They would not require substantive or significant resources to complete the request. Um, they are limited to data that's classified as public data under the law, and they generally would be tied to existing city policies, programs, and projects. That general definition outlining what constitutes an informal request uh, matches the provisions provided in the city charter uh, for what types of levels of uh, requests council members can make of departments. It's found in section 7.1H1, A, B, and C. So I'm going to for, uh, focus first on the formal request classification since it's the more detailed and prescriptive. You can see that on the uh, slide in front of you now. Under the general classification of formal requests, there are basically three top types in this three-tiered model, uh, shown here as the inquiry at the first level, the referral at the second level, and as a directive at the third and highest level. Remember that formal requests generally are going to pertain to the council's formal policymaking and oversight functions as a body. Therefore, our recommendations here ensure that all council members are informed of each original uh, formal request as well as the response that's given. An inquiry could be initiated by any council member. An inquiry would request data, information, or analyses or other work primarily relating to an existing or a proposed new or amended policy program or project. The response to an inquiry could escalate to a formal referral which would be a formal action by the council to seek further or additional information. As a referral, the council is giving clear indication that the body is interested uh, in the subject or the proposal that is the subject of the referral. And at this point, the referral would be committing enterprise resources toward the investigation of a specific subject matter beyond a basic inquiry. A, a referral would be handled through the agenda process and would usually be addressed by the standing committee having subject matter jurisdiction, but it ultimately would be addressed as a formal vote of the full council. As a referral, council is referring to staff a specific scope of work to be performed and reported back, generally with findings and recommendations. A referral at level two then could escalate to a formal council directive. A directive would be a formal action taken by the body that directs departments to take specific action on a defined subject matter. And as with a referral, the primary oversight is generally handled by the standing committee having subject matter jurisdiction. However, a directive, again, ultimately would be a formal action of the full council taken by vote. And because referrals and directives constitute formal actions by the council as defined in the city charter, they would be subject to the approval or veto of the mayor set forth in section 4.4c. Essentially then, an inquiry is one council member or even a small number of council members who have identified a topic of interest where input, analysis, and expertise from the city's professional staff in the administration are needed. A referral is where that topic is now the expressed interest of the full council with primary direction coming from its standing committee that has oversight of the subject matter. A directive, the highest level of request, is likely setting up formal action to enact new legislation or public policy or to make significant amendments to authorize major research projects or investigations. As an example of this three-tier system, a council member may make an inquiry into whether or not the city's existing land use codes permit a certain kind of development and request an analysis of comparable zoning allowances from other jurisdictions. 
the response to that inquiry, which would be shared with all policymakers, could result in that council member escalating the issue through a formal referral. This would be made as a motion at the standing committee with subject matter jurisdiction. In this case, that likely would be the business inspections and housing and zoning committee so that further research and analysis could be completed as the basis for a potential code amendment. That would be subject to a formal vote by both the committee and the full council and would then be subject to the approval or veto of the mayor. Assuming that that referral is approved through that process, the formal response would be referred back from staff to the biz committee, providing that its analysis together with any findings and possible implications to existing policies and any recommendations on how to address those changes in the existing zoning codes here in Minneapolis. Based on that response to a referral, professional staff in the administration might help a council member develop a formal directive which uh, could also be brought forward to committee on that zoning issue. It might include other issues like land use provisions, technical implementation standards, and other matters that need to be required as part of that decision. The directive would be voted on again by the committee as a recommendation to the full council, which could adopt the directive by a formal vote. The mayor would have approval or veto of that action. If it's approved, the directive would become binding direction on the city's departments. And the next step in the process could be for the council member to give notice of intent to introduce an ordinance at a former formal council meeting. So what you can see through that whole example is what we're attempting to do with this request process is add more structure, transparency, and consistency to the work that is currently preparatory to the formal notice of an ordinance introduction. This would also, however, be applicable to actions bringing forward new policies or policy amendments, direction on studies and research to be conducted, and similar types of actions. This work has largely been done outside of the public eye and has not been standardized in a predictable and consistent manner in the past. So this would accomplish those objectives and it would create an established process for council members to conduct their policymaking and oversight functions in concert with the administration's support, but without any disruption or interference in the established business plans and working um, operations of those departments. Mr. Carl, Mr. I'm going to interrupt you for a question for or a comment question from or council, comment president. council president. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. You may have just, may have just uh, uh, answered this question, Mr. Carl, but um, just for clarity. So earlier in our meeting, we I requested um, from Director Momquist um, the number of single family homes that are owned by multinational corporations. How would we classify that in this level one, two, three? Is that uh, a simple inquiry at this point? Mr. Carl, you're on mute. Uh, apologies uh, to the council president's question. The inquiry might not even be um, part of this formal request process, but might actually be started as an informal request, but I, which I haven't covered yet. Um, it was raised in a council meeting, so at the very uh, least, I would assume that our city assessor would be providing the responsive data to that request to all council members so that every council member had access to that information and it could influence decision making down the road. But I'm, I'm not certain I can tell you it would have to be a level one, two, or three in a formal re report or request process. It might be an informal request uh, that could easily be satisfied by the assessor. So um, if it were, however, done as a formal request, certainly it could start here at level one and the assessor could provide the information back to all council members and there might not be any further direction made. Okay, it's still a little muddy, but thank you. <laughs> so uh, proceeding along, Madam Vice President, the next step in that formal process is uh, to ensure accountability having all requests logged and tracked. And so each formal request would be made according to standardized forms uh, filed with the city clerk. The city clerk would be responsible for assisting council members in completing those request forms and logging each of them uh, as they're uh, filed and then formally processing them 
with the city coordinator so that they would be subject to similar the process of giving notice in the formal legislative process today. It ensures that all council members are aware of each request. So it's circulated to all council members and then it's given to the city coordinator for processing. The next slide uh, is going to talk about internal referrals. Here the city coordinator will act as the central coordinating point in the enterprise for receiving, routing, and managing internal referral processes for formal requests. The coordinator would be responsible for ensuring that all relevant departments are involved in the preparation of a response to each formal request and that each response is comprehensive in scope. When necessary, uh, status reports about those requests can be made by the city coordinator to keep all council members informed about internal work on their requests. As noted, all relevant departments would be engaged in responding to each request, even if not identified specifically in the original request. The coordinator would be responsible for ensuring that the process engages all departments in the process of responding, and where necessary, the administration would be responsible for anticipating and including any response um, that would need a fiscal, operational, racial equity, or other analyses relevant to the request. Uh, similarly, if the future action required by Council uh, would necessitate changes, the administration should anticipate and identify what those potential changes or formal actions might be and provide their professional recommendations. Finally, a complete response would be filed with the City Clerk and circulated to all Council members. Where appropriate, the responses would be added to an agenda for the appropriate meeting of the committees having subject matter jurisdiction for any formal follow-up action, which could include a referral or a directive, as I indicated in my example. Of course, that determination would be a matter for the full council by formal action. That closes out the process of formal requests. Uh, there are also, as I mentioned, are informal requests. Informal requests, as I noted, are essentially requests for information by council members, either for themselves or for their constituents. And these would be restricted primarily to public data readily available or which is easy to compile or prepare with only minor staff time to produce. Informal requests are transactional in nature. That is, the request is made directly from a council member to the department and a response is given from the department to the council member. Most requests, to your point, council president, likely can and should begin at this level. Departments can help council members uh, through their interactions on these requests to understand if the requested data is available and meets the parameters of an informal request. And if so, they will immediately provide that information as quickly as possible. But departments can also suggest to a council member that the nature of the request should probably be done by initiating a more formal request starting with an inquiry. And departments can also then provide help and consultation and guidance on how to help prepare that formal inquiry to help save time and effort uh, in terms of responding to the request. Informal requests are not anticipated to be logged and tracked in the enterprise because they're informal and they're between the council member and departments. The understanding here is that council members are requesting data that's defined as public data by law, which is readily available and exists and which can or should be easily produced or compiled with very little effort or time commitment by departments. Ward offices may wish to track their own informal requests and certainly staff in the legislative department could help track internal uh, requests for council as well. But these requests would not be included in the formal enterprise-wide tracking system that's envisioned to help manage formal requests. But as I noted, uh, and to your point again, council president, an informal request could escalate into a formal request shown on this slide. Generally, this would be in response to communications between a council member and the operating departments where the feedback they're getting through their interactions and conversations is that a more formal process probably would be helpful. Um, that process would help ensure greater accountability, transparency, the ability to ensure a very comprehensive response that includes the entire enterprise, as well as the necessity to recognize and respect the fact that it's the council that holds all power. Um, in the legislative and policymaking functions of the city government and that individual council members have no power. So then, Madam Vice President, uh, on this slide, we're presenting a summary of the recommendations staff offer in terms of creating a draft formal policy that would codify the process I've just described in some detail. 
uh, we would recommend that a report back date of April 26 would provide sufficient time for us to uh, draft that policy, uh, circulate that to council members, brief them, and respond to any uh, initial feedback or questions prior to a formal presentation. I'd be happy to pause here to respond to any questions about this administrative interaction policy that's been outlined uh, before finishing the presentation. Thank you. I will add for my colleagues that this is about, um, we, I think we all agree, those that I've had an opportunity for conversation about this with uh, recently all agree, we need a little bit more rigor as to how we do formal staff directions um, here as we move forward on council. And um, essentially the staff direction is simply the next step, um, asking the coordinator and clerk's office to work with all of us to build out a proposal for that. So to further flush out what this presentation is about today. I see a couple people in queue. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just had a quick question around um, what do we think is the level of discretion that we envision that department staff will have in, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming the way this will work is we will make a request and we won't necessarily have a good idea of how much effort we're asking of a department and based on that level of effort, a department staff or director will um, recommend it be formal or just address it as an informal request. But to what extent do we envision discretion playing a role there? I mean, I, I have uh, experience working at the staff level in the before times and um, and I think this is just true of any large institution. So much of the work that happens here is based on the relationships that you have and you know, I don't want to be too cynical, but it's like you can imagine you can have good relationships or, you know, distant relationships with various uh, parts of the institution. And based on the health of those relationships, you may get more or less responsiveness based on the individual person you're working with. So how much discretion do you envision um, being a component to making that determination of a formal versus informal request? Madam Vice President, um, thank you for that question, Councilmember Repayne. I'm not sure I can answer it directly, but I'll I'll try by sort of uh, hitting a roundabout. And that is, as I mentioned um, on the slide where I introduced informal requests, I think the vast majority of requests from Council should and can start at this level. It should be an email or a phone call or even an in-person interaction between the Council member uh, and the responsive staff, uh, making sure their leadership is involved to just say, I'm interested in this issue. I have a question. Can you, can you give me some feedback? I think from that dialogue, you're going to find council, uh, council member that departments are eager to work with you to improve their own operations, to get resources, to serve the community. Um, we are fortunate in the city to have very well qualified professionals throughout our ranks from top to bottom, and they want to do a good job. So as part of doing a good job, I think those informal contacts will make that work more um, dynamic, responsive, faster, fluid, um, and it will build positive relationships between council members and departments, um, quite frankly. And so I, I encourage council members and departments to keep as much at the informal as possible. But I think as you're working to shape what it might be, departments might say, you know, I'm not sure that I'm the only department that would contribute to this issue. Um, there might be others. I know there are others and I'd want to get their impact. Uh, this is clearly going to be more than, you know, a couple days work. This is going to be a, a study. We probably need to escalate this to at least an inquiry so that we can make sure we're using that formal, transparent, public process, right? Because as we're logging and tracking that, people can access that information through data practices requests as well. Um, and so that has a tendency to push it into that public realm of the council's operations where it can't be easily resolved. So in terms of discretion, I think departments obviously have a great deal of discretion over their day-to-day -day operations and knowing their work product, but they also want to and do work very closely with policymakers, especially those committees that exercise direct oversight. And I think that those positive relationships will help to ensure that where things are escalated or where they recommend that it be escalated into a formal process, it's because they want to make sure we're following the process so things can be tracked, transparent, accountable, engage the entire enterprise, and make sure that the response that's given is, is a fulsome response that is shared with all policymakers and not just one or two. Council member Shugtai.
Thank you, Chair Palmisano. Mr. Clerk, I, I, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to how we are we're thinking about ensuring a shared understanding between council members, um, directors and staff broadly about what constitutes a formal request versus an informal one. Uh, thank you, council member for that question. I, I think this piggybacks a little bit on what I just uh, offered in terms of a, a partial response to council member Payne's question that is, it's going to be the give and take between council members as elected policymakers and department staff, especially through department leaders, in terms of developing the policy, implementing and managing the policy. And over time, we'll get a sense of where um, those divisions happen. Uh, what I was hoping is that the policy would be flexible enough to give us space to work together um, and not overly prescriptive, but that it would at least establish some very broad categories, very broad classifications, so that there is a an ability referring to a written policy, right? It's a written policy we can refer to that says, you know, here we are at the inquiry status. Here's that form. Here's that process. Now that I've gotten the information back from this formal inquiry that's shared with all of my colleagues, I really want to move forward to a referral process. That's the next step. And so there would be a series, there would be a policy, but there'd also be accompanying procedures and forms to help us with implementation and give us guidance. And as with our existing policies over time, those would be changed and refined uh, to reflect shared understanding and, and changes in how we operate. So this is just a starting point, and I think it would take all of us together to sort of make those definitions that are right now very conceptual as I'm sharing them with you today. Right. I think that that's a that's a helpful explanation. The I, I think one of the first flags that comes to mind for me, or or I I think just to explain the math of where that question is coming from, is just understanding, um, you know, based on what you've shared with us so far, um, that like engaging in a formal request process is, um, it, I mean, it's a lengthy one, right? And so the ensuring that we have a shared understanding of what is formal versus informal um, allows for, in my opinion, right, like allows for us to not have a, a system of governance that is uh, in, in the legislative department, right, that is, um, that is slower than ever before, right? Because, you know, all requests suddenly start getting, um, are interpreted by, you know, specific departments or specific council members as um, as formal requests, and suddenly we start engaging in a formal process over over things. And now we have uh, like a system that is more inefficient than ever before. Um, if, through, but, through the council vice president, I I will um, maybe start a, a response to this. I don't know that I have a, a an on point response, but I would at least offer these comments having been within the city enterprise for 12 years. The process we've outlined is one that exists today, just not formally. What this does is formalize and standardize a process that does exist today. Today, for example, we have a process I will speak bluntly, I think is unfair, inaccurate, inaccessible, untransparent to the public. And that is that we allow council members to introduce subject matters of ordinances without actually having a draft. Um, and so because an individual council member can say, I'm introducing an ordinance, uh, there's nothing there. Uh, council gives it its first reading without ever seeing a draft. Uh, we refer it to departments and that's when drafting begins. And if there's not clear understanding at that point, it gets delayed. And so what I'm suggesting to you is the work that would automatically happen today, which is already delaying work, is just happening now more on the front end and is being standardized, consistent, transparent, and using um, a consistent process instead of it being driven by one or two council members outside of that, um, the eye of the public, if you will. If I might I, also just jump in and add, um, council member, I, some of the ways that we've begun to talk about this um, are might be something like if it takes less than five hours for city staff to put together, um, that's really more of an informal type of request. Um, I mean, that's not anything set in stone or anything, but that's kind of as we start our conversations with each other around this. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is acknowledge that the process that we've had in the past is actually less equitable. 
um, you know, it's it's more prone to um, relationships and, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to create something that's more fair and, and more um, ultimately would speed things up, right? If If everything is treated a little bit more fairly and sorted a little bit better, I think that ultimately the goal would be to have the process a little bit less bogged down. But this is a point of discussion as we as we move forward and your point is well taken. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clark and Madam Chair. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know this is about recommended directions, for instance, around this uh, request refer respond uh, model and some of these other pieces talked about. So, Mr. Carl, I'm not sure if this is a good time to mention the work plan stuff. Uh, Ab absolutely, Council uh, Member Johnson. Yes, I think this is a great right. piece. Perfect. Well, I, I just thought I'd uh, mention this and I, I appreciate the conversation specifically just around process for this. I think this is really important in terms of uh, creating a more consistent process around how we do this policy work and being more transparent in it. And so one of the things that uh, myself and uh, Public Works and Infrastructure Vice Chair Koski, uh, what we are doing is working on developing out a work plan for our committee. And so we've had meetings with almost every single council member now just to hear their thoughts about what their priorities are, what's important. We've been uh, meeting with department leadership around what the division directors uh, and the department leadership's priorities are, met with the mayor about it. We're trying to consolidate all that together and then have a working session with the committee uh, where we can actively refine and prioritize and then uh, figure out who is working on what and have really a roadmap for the committee so we can be as productive as possible. And it's something that uh, in my time on council, I know Councilmember Gordon uh, started some work on this previously, I think in my first term, but we haven't really seen something like this, but I think it's a good way to uh, come up with uh, essentially our pipeline of policy so we can be as productive as possible. And so we can uh, work within the constraints of staff capacity so we can also align our work with uh, strategic priorities and uh, make sure that there are no gaps in it and so that we can be transparent and share with the public uh, what we're working on. And so, you know, I don't bring all this up uh, uh, just to, you know, uh, toot our own horn <laughs> about the work that we're doing, but really to uh, emphasize that I think there is this opportunity uh, for the council to standardize this sort of an approach and for each committee to do this work, especially as we're doing this work. I, I think it's important for the public to know, you know, we we do tend to naturally divide a lot of our, our uh, work on the council among these different committees in terms of where we're focused uh, in such a way that Usually not every single council member is able to focus on every single issue because frankly, there's not enough hours in the day for that. And so there is a, a bit of a team approach here and there probably can be even more so. And I think uh, the way we structure our processes can lend itself to that. And then frankly can also help us uh, work out details and come into alignment with, with one another uh, in the process. So I'm happy to work with council leadership and the clerk on uh, exploring this. I, I don't think that the way uh, we are doing it right now for public works and infrastructure is a, necessarily a one size fits all model. I think there's a lot of nuance in terms of the different material and, and subject matter uh, before each committee. Uh, and, you know, people have different strengths in, in terms of uh, chairs and vice chairs and what their uh, interests are and the degree to which they want to engage in planning work. but. Uh, I do think there's more that we could be doing here and would love to hear any thoughts uh, from the clerk on this and how that might get wrapped up into this uh, larger conversation. Council Vice President, um, I, I will take the opportunity to say to Council Member Johnson's comments and his proposal, uh, we had a great conversation uh, just before between the POGO and Cal meetings today to talk about this, this work that he and Council Member Koski as leadership of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee have done to develop a work plan 
I think this is a really good um, systemic way of helping us structure and uh, systematize council's work in a way that is standardized, consistent, and available, you know, transparent to the public and accessible to the public. Um, I, I hope to learn from them how they did theirs and structure it. I think it would be good for us to bring that forward. And I welcome Council President Jenkins or Vice President Palmasano to add to this. I know that at the beginning of the year as we organized, this concept of the idea of committee work plans was something that we discussed. Um, and so uh, Councilmember Johnson and Councilmember Koski and their leadership of the PWI committee have certainly uh, jumped forward and moved ahead on that. But I know that this was a, a subject matter that Cal uh, Council President Jenkins and Council Vice President Palmasano had identified very early on as something to help us really structure and organize Council's leadership work in terms of local legislation and public policy. So I'm excited to uh, work with other Council committees in uh, preparing similar work plans going forward. Yes, and I'll just add that um, Council Member Johnson said he didn't want to toot his own horn, but I would, I would certainly be one to step up and praise the work of our Public Works and Infrastructure Committee and in getting all of that together. Um, we'd like to get to the point where other committees have committee plans and that departments have work plans for the year too. How we um, do this and how staff directions fit into that work plan or not might be one of the routing measures as to how we do this at the end of the day. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair and um, Mr. Carl. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely 100% agree. I also uh, commend um, Council Member Johnson when I saw that work plan come out um, from uh, the public works chair and vice chair, I, I thought, wow, that is how all of our committees should uh, actually, you know, and, and things will change, right? Like, uh, but at least you have a roadmap to begin with. But I think it's going to be imperative in order to make those committee um, work plans that we have department work plans in order to um, inform those work plans. So um, agree and and we will need those um, um, department work plans as well. Madam Vice Chair, uh, I'm happy to just finish off the presentation and we can consider your proposed directive uh, when that's done um, or we can take that up now. It's uh, uh, however you wish to do that. I think we'll go on. I know you have just a few more slides here and we'll do that at the end as we receive and file the report. Um, okay, so I'll continue. Uh, as many council members have been inquiring and have said today, um, the work to create a legislative department that would support council and its official functions is something that um, is on all of our minds. We've obviously spent most of our time thus far and our attention on the mayor and on the city administration. So I want to just highlight um, some work that's been done in this regard, which is preliminary to future reporting. Last year, after the results of the election were announced and certified as official, the council adopted a directive which required the clerk and the auditor to evaluate the operating structures in comparable cities for legislative departments and to report back recommendations about how a similar department could be established here in Minneapolis. Um, the auditor, Mr. Patrick, and I have been working on that analysis since that time. We're now at the point where we're ready to brief council members on our recommendations um, and to take any feedback that council members have in advance of a formal presentation to this body. As this slide here shows, we've identified uh, the core functions of council which constitute its official and legitimate functions uh, in three very broad categories. Those include policy making, oversight, and representation. And you can see some very simple definitions of each of those categories on this slide. Our focus uh, has been on exploring how appropriate resources should be allocated to each of these major functions within the parameters of the city charter. So it requires us to think about the charter. The city charter provides that the council appoints and has direct supervision of the city clerk who functions as the clerk and parliamentarian of the council and supports its legislative operations and its administrative functions. The council has indirect authority over the city auditor who is appointed by 
and is directly accountable for a defined term to an independent audit committee. This isolation helps to preserve the um, professional status, the objectivity, and the neutrality of the auditor. The clerk and the auditor then are the professional nonpartisan staff officers of the council. The council also has the ability to provide for its own aides for individual members. These aides then are the personal and political support for council members and primarily uh, work on supporting representational functions, especially including constituent services. So we do look forward to bringing forward a report with all of our recommendations at the next regular meeting of this body that will address our proposals on those three uh, categories of function. And so with that, Madam President, I'll just note uh, this subcommittee is set to meet again on Tuesday, April 12th, at which time we would anticipate that the body will take up and discuss the mayor's plan for executive organization. We would receive a report related to, as I just teased, the structuring of the legislative department, and we would accept an update on the status of the draft policy about structured council and administration interactions. Um, and again, I'll remind folks about the city website where all of this information is being tracked. It can be accessed at minneapolismn.gov forward slash government forward slash structure. I also noted that staff anticipates regular briefings and updates on the work to implement this new government structure. And with thanks to you, Madam Vice President and President Jenkins, we are finalizing a schedule for the remainder of this year that would identify dates and times for those regular public reports to be brought forward to this subcommittee. Obviously, um, there is a need to do some extensive work to bring forward all those amendments I mentioned earlier to the charter and codes, and that work will be funneled through this subcommittee so that the council and the community have a single place uh, where they can track this important work. I anticipate bringing forward that final schedule at our next subcommittee meeting as well. So with that, I've concluded my presentation. Madam Vice President, I'd be happy to stand for questions or we can ask the technical team to uh, post your staff directive. Actually, this is, oh, um, I was just gonna call on Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Um, yeah. You are in queue. I thought you were saying you were not in queue for this part of the presentation, but it seems that you are. Go right ahead. Thank you, Madam uh, <laughs> uh, Chair uh, Palmasano. Uh, Clerk Casey, I'm glad to hear that there's going to be uh, forthcoming information about the legislative process um, at our next meeting. Um, I'm interested in knowing, um, you know, what other staff or departments are you also working with in creating this legislative kind of outline um in alignment with this government structure that mayor fry is proposing uh so primarily uh, to the council member's question we've been working at reviewing how other city governments are structured we have not engaged uh, other internal departments at this point our anticipation is that we are going to be briefing council members to share with you our recommendations and our thoughts having looked at other cities and other cities with strong council uh, systems where there are full-time council members that operate with committees and have their own uh, resources and operate independently of, a, of an executive. So based on those, we'll share with you our recommendations, get your input, um, and at that process, as with the mayor's proposals, those would then have to come through a formal process where we would be engaging um, the other existing departments within the administration uh, and bringing forward, you know, ordinances and other work to make that uh, implementation effective. Thank you, Clerk Casey. Councilmember Shugtai. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope to just make this very brief. Uh, uh, Mr. Clerk, I think I, I heard you say that um, that other departments have not been engaged in, um, other city departments have not been engaged in um, fleshing out what the legislative uh, department is going to look like. Just wanna make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So outside of the city clerk and the internal auditor, no other city departments have been have had conversations or been engaged in conversations regarding what the legislative department structure will look like. Uh, through the council vice president, Councilmember Shugtai, uh, I have not engaged other departments. Uh, my understanding is neither has Mr. Uh, Patrick. 
However, I can share with you that the council or the city coordinator, Ms. Johnston, has had her Office of Performance Innovation look into uh, other cities. They've done some research and they forwarded that research to Mr. Patrick and me for us to consider as we've looked at our own research. So I know that OPI had done some research. They've shared it with us. Uh, we've done our own research. Uh, and based on all of that, we're going to be sharing our recommendations with council members um, as, as what we think would constitute a good legislative department to support council. Okay, so uh, I'm understanding then it's the city clerk, the internal auditor, the city coordinator, and the Office of Performance and Innovation then, that have been involved in, in the recommendations that you'll be briefing council members on. Yes. Got it. Um, and the research that the Office of Performance and Innovation and the city coordinator have done, is that going to be shared with council members as well, or has it been shared with council leadership so far? Uh, council Vice President, to the council members question, I'm happy to share with you the research that uh, OPI produced and was transmitted to us through the city coordinator. It has not been shared with anyone but Mr. Patrick and I. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, I would love to take a look at that research. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and um, Carl and um, Council Member Chuck Tai. I, I do want to um, confirm that we're still going to continue with our um, quarterly race equity updates, which will mean that we will need to complete our strategic plan, need to be able to identify the, the goals and measurements that we want to hear reporting back on. Um, and um, and yeah, I would, I would be interested in seeing uh, the Office of Performance um, and Innovations uh, research as well. Thank you. Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Chair Parmesano. Um, I just want to also say for the record, I would like to see a copy of the OPI uh, uh, document or report that was also done on the legislative branch. Um, and if there's any way to get this up, I know we're all invested in public transparency, but if there's a way to get that up on LIM so the public can also see it before we come to our next uh, you know, government structure subcommittee uh, meeting, I think that would be great. Also, in thinking of the the point that council president just raised about the race, uh, race and equity uh, subgroup or subcommittee, um, if there's any RAIA that has been done, the race and equity analysis done on um, some of the stuff that you've compiled around the legislative branch, I think, of course, we would love to see that come forward too um, to make sure that we're hitting our, you know, racial equity goals as we fold into this new government structure. Yep, understood. There's um, a lot of moving parts, as the council president said, um, in terms of getting everything sequentially in order so that we can do these kinds of benchmarks. Um, thank you, it's thank including, you, Mr. Including uh, onboarding our race equity director, which that position has right. been vacant for um, a number of months now, so yeah. Yeah, so just wanting to set some realistic expectations um, and in moving forward. Um, thank you, Mr. Clerk, for this presentation. I'm not seeing any further discussion at this time, so I'm going to direct the clerk to file that pr presentation and publish that report. And I'll also move the staff direction that was sent last night via the clerk's office um, and should be able to be displayed on the screen. This just again simply says we're going to have staff work with all 13 of us on how we add a little bit more rigor to our current process of staff directions um, and consider requests that go to departments um, that are more than just informal requests. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Payne. Uh, 
pipes? I'm sorry, was that an, a yay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Member Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. That's the ayes and zero nays. Thank you. That passes and next we will receive reports from the standing committees on matters to be considered by full council this Thursday. I will also note that this is going to be the last committee of the whole meeting that we do online together. So something to keep in mind that items that get delayed or aren't finished this week uh, will end up in in person public meetings over the course of the next cycle. Uh, we'll start with the business inspections, housing and zoning committee. The chair of that committee is Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, the biz committee will bring eight, be bringing 18 items forward for approval on Thursday. Item one, two, and three are land sales. Item number four is a land sale for the Midtown Crossing affordable housing project. And item five are a resolution for bond approval uh, for the Midtown Crossing Affordable Housing Project. Item six is a final plat appeal by Roberta Castellano and the committee moved to deny the appeal. Item seven are the liquor license approvals and eight are the liquor license renewals. Item nine are license operating conditions for ties, lounge, and rooftop. Item number 10 is accepting grants from the Met Council Livable Communities Awards. Item number 11 are the spring grant applications for pre-development grants from the Met Council. Item 12 is a resolution appropriating funding for the Upper Harbor Terminal. Item 13 are amendments to our inclusionary zoning revenue offset assistance policy. Item 14 is a loan for a naturally occurring affordable housing project at 3121 Third Avenue South. Item 15 is a parking lease agreement with PCYC. Item 16 is a much awaited contract with mid Minnesota legal aid to support low income renters. This is part of our right to council ordinance and funding behind it. Item number 17 is a contract amendment and item 18 is an appointment to the Heritage Preservation Commission, uh, Meredith Anderson in ward nine. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions, items one through 18. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions or comments. I would ask if people have prepared amendments that they're bringing on Thursday, uh, that after the committee report would be a good time just to make everybody aware of them. Next up is the Policy and Government Oversight Committee that we had this morning chaired by Council Member Ellison. Council Member Ellison, are you ready with that report already? Yes, the clerks uh, were speedy um, and uh, I appreciate it. And so um, the Policy and Government Oversight Committee uh, has 30 items that it will bring forward for recommendation at this week's council meeting. Item number one is a gift acceptance from Friends of the Fall for the Upper St. Anthony Lock for land acquisition due diligence related cost. Uh, item number two is gift acceptance from Kaufman Foundation for a spring mayor chief of staff convening at Harvard Kennedy School. Item number three is rollover of unspent 2021 American Rescue Plan Act funds an exchange of funds, uh, fund, funding resources between projects. Uh, item number four is a bid for Franklin Avenue uh, West reconstruction project. Item number five is a bid for hot mix asphalt. Item number six is a bid for small diameter pipe cleaning inspections. Items uh, seven through 17 are contract amendments for various contracts related to the public service building. Uh, Item number 18 is a contract amendment with uh, Lametti and Sons Inc. for the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam Water Services uh, Relocation Project. 
Item 19 is a contract amendment with the Center for Energy and Environment for Home Energy Squad Visits and Energy Efficiency Loans. Item number 20 is a contract amendment with Sherman Associates for the Fire Station Number 1 project. Item 21 is establishing a consulting pool for IT staff augmentation uh, consulting services. Item 22 is a contract with uh, X Safety LLC for 2022 through 2024 customized safety training and training services vendor pool. Item 23 is contracts with the Minnesota Homeownership Center, Build Wealth Minnesota, Emerge, NeighborWorks Home, NeighborWorks Home Partners, and uh, uh, CAPI USA for financial wellness, home buyer education services, and foreclosure counseling. Item 24 is a legal settlement, uh, uh, Megan Wolf versus the city of Minneapolis. Item 25 is a legal settlement, Alicia Truman on her own behalf and as trustee for the next of kin, kin of Norman Truman versus the city of Minneapolis. Item 26 is a legal settlement, uh, which is a workers' compensation claim uh, of Aaron Collins. Item 27 is the election precinct boundaries de designation. Item 28 is the 2022 polling place designation. And item 20, uh, uh, 29 is the collective bargaining agreement uh, with the Minneapolis uh, Police Officers Federation. Uh, this item is being moved forward without recommendation. And item number 30 is an easement agreement for the fire station number 27 driveway. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. I wanted to uh, call on Council Member Johnson to speak to an item about uh, on the POGO agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is uh, uh, just in the spirit of uh, your request to speak to any motions we'll be making around uh, these items on item number 29, specific to the police union contract uh, that was forwarded without recommendation of the council. We heard a lot, a lot of really great information at committee. I think it was uh, a great precedent in terms of public transparency and really important information to share as well. I also personally think that the public uh, needs time to process that information more than 48 hours, uh, which is uh, they have less than uh, 48 hours to process that information. Uh, if we take up the police contract on uh, Thursday, so I do plan on moving to postpone that one cycle so that members of the public have a chance to process all that information. And if they have any additional uh, comments, questions, anything like that, they're able to speak to their respective uh, council members as well uh, before the council uh, takes that up. And then related to that, I also wanted to mention that uh, there was a separate motion to add a public hearing related to that. That motion failed. I was actually uh, one of the council members that voted against that motion on adding a public hearing. And I did want to note just publicly that I am working on drafting a uh, a motion to or a staff direction uh, to get some recommendations back on how moving forward in the future we can solicit uh, public uh, input on labor contracts in a in a way that we actually have a process around it that it can be useful and actionable and how we collect that uh, and so I'm not sure if I will have time to have all the T's crossed and I's dotted before Thursday with that and have staff buy it on the draft language and uh, I certainly plan on working with uh, Pogo Chair Ellison on draft language and, and making sure I am collaborating with him and also with Council Member Wansley Warloba who I know brought forward the motion around the public hearing but I did want to mention it at least at this meeting that uh, that's my intent is to uh, bring forward a draft staff direction at some point uh, here either Thursday or at an upcoming POGO meeting uh, because I think we can do more in the long term of how we uh, engage with the public in uh, gathering input that can uh, help the city with what issues are within scope and future negotiations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you and thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. The next committee report we have is Public Health and Safety Committee chaired by Councilmember Vito.
Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee has three items it will bring forward for consideration at this week's council meeting. Item number one is accepting a Minnesota Department of Health grant amendment for maternal, maternal child health federal home visiting funds. Item number two is accepting a Mississippi Watershed Management Organization grant for erosion and sediment control enforcement. And item number three is authorizing a grant application to the Minnesota Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management to support prevention, preparation, mitigation, response, and recovery efforts from acts of terrorism and other hazards. That is all of our business. Thank you. Next, we'll have the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee report. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, we have eight items that we are bringing forward. The first is a project approval and assessment related to the Cheatham Residential Street Resurfacing uh, Project. The second is also a project approval and assessment for the Legion Lake Residential Street resurfacing project. The third is a project approval and assessment and area way abandonment for the Luella Anderson neighborhood project phase two. The fourth is a grant application for the 2022 Metro uh, Paulson Council regional solicitation for tra federal transportation funds. The fifth is a variance request uh, from municipal state aid standards for Hennepin Avenue South street reconstruction. The sixth is uh, municipal state aid appropriation and revenue increase related to Franklin Avenue West street reconstruction project. The seventh is a memorandum of understanding with MPRB and Hennepin County for land conveyance. And the eighth is a large block event permit for Rock the Garden. With that, I will stand for any questions. Thank you. Seeing none, um, I did want to just finally call on our Council President Jenkins um, for anything else that might be coming up at the full Council meeting this Thursday. Council President. Yes, thank you, Madam uh, Chair and colleagues. I do want to just give everyone a heads up that I plan to bring forward a motion at our full Council meeting on Thursday that would direct the City Clerk to prepare a resolution and bring that forward in the next cycle to create the housing rent stabilization work group. Um, I've been working with staff over the past several weeks to outline what I believe is a solid plan for the, the council to provide meaningful um, community engagement on this important issue. Uh, I think there's been a uh, strong consensus amongst uh, us that this important topic should be driven by the voices of community stakeholders and that any policy recommendations that are supported by broad by a broad based coalition of the community will ultimately be the best for the city of Minneapolis. And I've been hearing very, very similar supportive remarks from community members to uh, advocates and, um, and labor groups and others around um, that proposal. So I, I think we're moving in the right direction. I know staff have had a chance to, to brief uh, all council members on the outline that I put together. And my intention is to secure by a formal vote, a direction to the city clerk to bring us a resolution in the next cycle that would formally establish that work group. Then the council and the mayor will need to decide the process for making appointments to that work group. And I anticipate that we'll be able to finalize uh, and make appointments to the work group uh, by the end of May, which means that we'll be looking to convene our first meeting of the work group in May. Um, I've asked the clerk to make sure that the motion is added to our agenda for our, our council meeting um, on Thursday. And so this is an early notice about that item so that we can begin advancing this really uh, important and impactful work uh, addressing housing stability and rent stabilization in Minneapolis. You know, we even, you know, the assessments um, that we report that we heard 
is going to really be challenging for the communities that we know are are really uh, critically challenged by um, um, nefar nefarious landlords, et cetera. And so um, really looking forward to getting this work started. Also want to just um, note and, and remind everybody, though, I'm sure uh, probably don't need one, but we will be taking up the matter of the mayor's veto this coming Thursday as well. So um, look forward to uh, uh, a pretty action packed um, agenda at our council meeting. And I, I do want to just commend, you know, all of my colleagues today. I, I know I sat in on the earlier POGO committee, uh, though I'm not a, a, a voting member of that committee. And I'm sure there are other council members there as well. It has been a uh, a pretty long uh, two committee Tuesday. And so I um, just want to thank everybody for their um, continued diligence and uh, perseverance in this work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you everybody for laying things out after we consider the mayor's veto. I do not see um, any other potential resolutions or actions. I'm sure we will know differently from our colleagues if that changes. So with that, we've concluded all business uh, to come before committee today. So hearing no objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone.